What's up, my big ol' global fam? Whether you're one of the OGs or just sliding in here for the first time, welcome to the crew. Smash that like button and hit subscribe if you dig what we're dropping. Oh. American B-2 Bomber Drops Another 30,000-pound bunker buster bomb on Houthi positions. The Houthis are back in the spotlight. Today, they claimed they hit an Israeli military site near Tel Aviv and targeted several U.S. warships, including the U.S. aircraft carrier Harry S. Truman. No one has confirmed these attacks, and as usual, the Houthis haven't provided any proof that they were successful. However, the U.S. has stepped back, and we've used B-2 bombers again to destroy Houthi hideouts. But that's not all, we have some huge news coming from the Middle East. The Houthis continue their attempts to attack Israel, but their missiles keep failing and landing in Saudi Arabia. It looks like Saudi Arabia's had enough and is now pushing back. Reports from the Houthis themselves indicate that Saudi artillery is targeting Houthi strongholds in Sada. In today's video, let's dive into exactly what the Houthis are targeting and why the US is sending B-2 bombers before moving forward. If you can, please subscribe to the channel below to stay up to date on all similar geopolitical news. Let's start by looking at the only real successful strike the Houthis managed, taking out another MQ-9 drone from the U.S. Navy. Here's the footage they released of the wreckage. Forget God. The Houthis also put out this statement claiming they targeted much more, including hitting a military site in occupied Jaffa with drones and hitting U.S. warships in the Red Sea. But none of this seems true, and it hasn't been confirmed by Israel or the U.S. The Houthis also launched a ballistic missile toward Israel, but sadly, it never made it. The missile they fired in Yemen actually hit Saudi Arabia, and it looks like it fell apart mid-flight, landing in Saudi territory. This situation just keeps getting worse because it's not the first time this has happened. In fact, it's happened multiple times over the past few weeks. The Houthis keep violating Saudi territory, and that's exactly why Saudi Arabia decided to get involved in this war. They've started targeting Houthi strongholds in Yemen, alongside the U.S. military, which has been talking about its role. It looks like the B-2s have been brought out again, and here we have footage of some strikes in Sana'a, Yemen. Based on satellite images, we can see where the B-2 bunker busters were dropped near a historic triangular fortress on Jabal Nam. Even Yemeni TV reported that the U.S. carried out strikes on the Jabal Nam capital. It's known that the mountain houses an underground complex used to store missiles and advanced drones. Much like Iran, several groups in the Middle East use the same strategy, building underground bunkers to store their weapons and even hide key personnel, like their leaders, to keep them safe. They do this to avoid U.S. airstrikes. That's exactly why we're using B-2s. These bombers are designed to destroy bunkers. In fact, B-2s were specifically built to destroy a very particular type of bunker used to house nuclear facilities in a Middle Eastern country. I'll let you guess which country I'm talking about. Anyway, we have a statement from Secretary of Defense Pete Hicksett, who explains how this mission fits into the bigger picture in the Middle East. Here's the clip. Three bad weeks for the Houthis, and it's about to get worse. It's been a devastating campaign, whether it's underground facilities, weapons manufacturing bunkers, or anti-aircraft defense forces. Air defense assets, we will not back down. In fact, we'll get even tougher until the Houthis stop firing at our ships. We've been very clear with the Iranians as well. They should stop supporting the Houthis. This message has been made crystal clear. We have a lot of options and more pressure to apply, and we know because we're seeing reports about the devastation this campaign has caused them. Let's be honest, the past few weeks have been rough for the Houthis, especially their leaders. In fact, we have reports from the Houthis themselves saying that many of their leaders have died, but they're being really shady about it. They're not saying they're dying from US strikes. Instead, they're claiming their leaders died from heart attacks or other natural causes. Here's a report from the Houthis announcing the death of Abd al-Nasser Saran al-Kamali and his family claiming he died of a heart attack, although the anti-Houthi coalition says he was killed in a U.S. airstrike. He's identified as a colonel in the Security and Intelligence Services. This operation has been ongoing since it started. Operation Rough Riders 2.0 B-2, Stealth Bomber Strikes, and the Iran Talks 
They're calling it Operation Rough Riders, though I think it's more like Rough Riders 2.0 because the original operation was back in the Theodore Roosevelt days. And it seems like 100 people have been confirmed dead from Houthi operations since mid-March. Here's more on what's happening right now. The Trump administration launched a major military operation on March 15 aimed at Houthi leaders, their command and control areas, and their assets. They're also going after Houthi communications infrastructure, tunnels, mountain hideouts, and weapons bases. Since March, the confirmed death toll from these operations has surpassed 100 based on Houthi funeral processions this week. The Houthis, backed by Iran, have ambitions that go beyond being just proxies at this point, but they still rely on Iran. For example, when we're talking about their ability to attack ships and reach Israel, they've got some serious anti-ship missiles. Trump recently announced that the U.S. and Iran are set to have high-level talks in Oman this weekend, focusing on Iran's support for terrorist groups in the Middle East and its nuclear program. Trump confirmed this week that the talks will be direct, with an American delegation meeting directly with an Iranian one. But Iran denied these claims, saying that the talks in Oman will be indirect. I guess that means Iran will talk to Oman, then Oman will talk to us, and vice versa. But after that... Iran said they're open to direct talks with the U.S. if things go well. Now, the only reason Iran is even open to these talks right now is because of the deployment of B-2 bombers. Specifically, the advanced deployment of six B-2s to Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. From that base, the B-2s are out of range of any weapons Iran could use to strike them first, but close enough to get into Iran and wipe out its nuclear facilities and still make it back safely. That's why Iran's been so worried over the last few weeks, especially with the U.S. carrying out B-2 strikes in Yemen with no issues. That's why we're seeing Iran being so open to the talks in Oman. So again, let's get Chuck Fierce to give us the lowdown on these B-2 stealth bombers and why they're so powerful. Then we'll walk through the recent battle scars and take a look at the B-21 Raider, the new kid on the block, ready to redefine air dominance. The B-2 isn't just a plane, it's a freak of nature that defies physics. With a bat-like silhouette and a wingspan of 172 feet, it's a flying wing design that goes way back to the visionary drawings of Jack Northrop in the 1940s. No tail, no traditional stabilizer, you'd think this thing would tumble through the sky like a drunken bat tossed into a blender. But that's where the specialized flight control systems come in, keeping it stable with four independent flight channels digital magic that keeps it steady in the air. The B-2 uses specialized semiconductors and advanced computing equipment, operating without the usual electromagnetic signatures that consumer electronics give off. Your iPhone's easy to track with a radar system, but the B-2? That thing's a ghost. It's an electromagnetic shadow, traveling at a speed of 0.9 Mach, just under the speed of sound. Real magic happens when it flies low. Its radar terrain following system, part of the ANAPQ-181, allows it to hug the ground under 200 feet, zooming at 600 on prior. It's not just flying, it's sewing a needle through the battlefield, bombing targets from treetop height and skimming over hills to stay under enemy radar. And the crew? Just two pilots. No more cramped cockpits. This isn't about flaunting stick and rudder skills, it's about managing a giant computer with wings. They got rid of the third crew seat to save weight, so it's just the duo, handling navigation, weapons, and systems via multifunction screens. This is no small feat when you're supersonic and flying over the deck on a moonless night. It's an automated ballet, a symphony of hydraulic code and pilot skill. That's why the B-2 can slip through protected airspace and restricted zones like it's invisible. Because stealth isn't just a buzzword for the B-2, it's the whole game. Its radar signature is non-existent. B-2, Stealth Bomber's Radar and Strategic Power Hidden away deep within the Pentagon, there's a top-secret detail that's about the size of a bumblebee, around 0.1 square meters. To put it into perspective, the radar signature of a B-52 bomber is about the size of a barn, over 100 square meters, and a SAM battery can lock onto it from over 100 miles away. So, how does the B-2 manage to dodge this? We'll start by saying no sharp edges, no protrusions, just smooth curves that scatter radar waves like a magician's sleight of hand. The aircraft structure is made of composite materials, 
carbon fibers, thermally dynamic plastics, and other secret stuff that not only deflect radar, but actually absorb it. There's a layer of radar-absorbing materials, a secret sauce of special coatings and paints that soak up electromagnetic energy and spit out heat instead of reflecting radar signals. You've got a stealth bomber platform here, with four General Electric F1 and 18 engines that each generate 17,300 pounds of thrust. These engines are buried deep inside the wings, and their exhaust is vented out the top through serpentine ducts, hiding thermal signatures and muffling noise. Even the turbine blades are made from single crystals of secret metal alloys that can withstand heat and won't bounce radar waves. Antennas shrink into the skin, and the control surfaces lock into stealth mode. Even the dark gray anti-reflective paint blends seamlessly with the sky at altitudes over 50,000 feet. Maintenance crews treat this bird like a diva. Any scratch or ding gets fixed immediately, because even the slightest flaw could jeopardize its radar cross-section. As a result, enemy air defense systems will see a brief flash, maybe a glitch, but nothing strong enough to lock onto this stealthy bomber. It's not invisible, but it's irrelevant to radar sensors that are looking for it. It just slips through the net, undetected. Now, back to the YouTube oddity. Did you catch that crazy ad? YouTube's paying creators $64 million every single day. Why? Because they're short on creators right now. That's why you're seeing videos with fewer than 1,000 views popping up in your feed. Of course, not everyone should start a channel, but if you've ever wondered about starting a YouTube channel or a faceless channel, now's the perfect time. YouTube's paying out more than ever, and they're funding newer, smaller channels. So if you're thinking about it, I've put together a free boot camp with all our tips on how to start and grow your own YouTube channel. You can sign up by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code on your screen. It's like a Zoom call, and there's a cap of 100 people at a time, so sign up fast before it fills up. Now, shifting gears to the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Precision-guided munitions are a game-changer against a numerically superior enemy that heavily relies on fortified positions and underground storage for ammo and command centers. I'm Chuck Fierce, a former SEAL Team 6 squadron leader and the bunker buster bombs designed to penetrate reinforced concrete, earth and steel before detonating are a key asset for the Ukrainian Air Force as the war enters its third year. Ukraine's arsenal has been bolstered with a variety of Western-supplied munitions, ranging from ready-to-go solutions to highly modified systems with specialized fuses. Today, we'll take a look at these weapons in ascending order of capability, from the humble J-Dam to the game-changing Storm Shadow and Scalp missiles, highlighting their modifications and real-world use against Russian targets. The JDAM, Joint Direct Attack Munition, represents the entry point into the Bunker Buster Toolkit developed by Boeing for the US Air Force and Navy. JDAM isn't an independent bomb. It's a tail-mounted guidance kit that turns dumb bombs ranging from 500 to 2,000 pounds into GPS-guided, all-weather smart weapons with a range of 15 miles, 28 kilometers, and an accuracy of 16 feet, 5 meters. The JDAM offers Ukraine an affordable, off-the-shelf solution for precision strikes on fixed targets. Its simplicity is its strength. It's a modular kit that works with existing bombs like the Mark 84, Mark 83, or Mark 82. The JDAM kit works effectively with the Blue 109 Warhead, a 2,000-pound penetrator that carries 550 pounds of explosives. The Blue 109 steel casing is an inch thick and reinforced to withstand the initial impact. It's designed to penetrate concrete shelters before the tail fuse FMU-143 triggers a timely detonation. While the standard JDAM doesn't have extended range or advanced penetration for specialized systems, its adaptability makes it an essential asset for bunker-busting operations. Yo, thanks for hanging out and watching this wild ride. Drop a comment and tell us what you think. And don't forget to smash that like button, sub to the channel, and hit the bell so you don't miss what's next. Here at X News, we keep it real, we keep it raw, and we bring you the facts with some flavor. Catch ya in the next video.
Stay sharp.